Please join me in the responsive reading printed in your order of service. At the break of the morning, the dawn of a new day, when the light of the sun touches the horizon and the darkness lifts to make way, surrounded by air sweet with spring, we take up breath within us to sing psalms of praise. At the zenith of the day, when greening life and warming skies abound, and in this song our souls rise and pay homage. Welcome everybody, an especially good looking crowd today. In case you don't know, my name is Tim Creamer. I've been coming to Fountain Street for almost 10 years now. One of the reasons I joined was because I was looking for a way to get involved in the community around me. I was looking for a way to make a difference in the world. In Michigan, one in four children is food insecure meaning that they or their parents don't know where their next meal is coming from at times. In Kent County, it's one in five, but it's not much better. Think of the issues this leads to. Hungry children have more health problems. They don't perform as well in schools. Hungry children lose hope for their future. Now, most of us we don't really know what it's like to be truly hungry. Not a few hours late for dinner, but truly hungry. I know, I know I don't, and if you know me, you can see it very easily. Some of you may know what this is like, and you may have known this feeling at times. Some of you may have been helped by a local pantry service. Access of West Michigan is dedicated to helping feed the hungry. A couple of the local agencies they support are Kids Food Basket, which I know many of you have worked at and volunteered at in the past, I have as well, and Feeding America of West Michigan, which helps us with our Christmas Elves program. Now this year, I'm the captain of the Fountain Street Church Hunger Heroes in the 38th Access Hunger Walk. This is my fifth year walking. Now last year, our team raised, out of all the teams in the, in the event, the third most of any team, which was incredible. I asked for the help of this congregation and you came through in, in great ways. Really made me proud to be part of this church. Showed what a difference we can make here. Again, I'm looking for walkers. This year the walk is May 3rd. I want a crowd big enough so that we really can be noticed that Fountain Street is there in, in big numbers. So let's again show other congregations what we can do, that we do care and that we can make a difference. Now, if you can't make it that day, or if the three and a half mile walk is a little more than what you can handle, we're also looking for sponsors. Every walker we have will need sponsors. So find somebody you know or don't know who's walking and sponsor them. Every little bit of difference can make it a big change. $30 can feed a family of four for a week through the food pantries. The next few weeks, this week and next week, I'll be in the social hall or this week out in the front well, uh, area by the doors. If you want to help, if you want to join in the walk or sponsor somebody, find me and I will help you do that. For any of you who are new here, I hope you're made to feel as welcome as I have been made to feel here. I hope you find a home here that I have found. And if no one reaches out a hand to you to make you feel welcome, Find me or somebody else here and introduce yourself. Talk to us about this church. Find out if it's a fit for you as it has been such a good fit for me. People often ask, what is liberal religion? What is this church all about? And here's some of the things I might tell them. Here at Fountain Street Church, people of all beliefs are welcome, even an atheist like me. Spiritual life is all about the journey. 
Every single one of us has the ability to make a change in the world, and here we seek to help bring about that in each, in each other. And most important to me, at Fountain Street Church, we are about deeds, not creeds. About liberation, not salvation. About justice, not righteousness. If these ideas speak to you, you have a home here, be it for a day, a lifetime, a believer or a non-believer, no matter your sex or sexual orientation, no matter your race, ethnicity, no matter your age or abilities, this is truly what Isaiah called a house of prayer for all people. Thank you.
As a part of the coming of age experience of our community, four young and extraordinary individuals have stepped forward with their families to take that next step along the path towards young adulthood, towards a greater balance between responsibility and freedom. This is not a small thing they do. And today we offer them one more step in that journey by echoing traditions that are prevalent in many religious ways, particularly that of the bar and bat mitzvah of Jewish tradition. So today we invite four young folks to come forward and speak from our bima, or the pulpit, to lead us in religious ritual. And they lead us by walking us through one of the oldest pieces of religious poetry available to us, the creation story. We welcome you this morning to pay particular attention to the words that conclude each of their narratives. And the divine saw, and it was good. As the processional comes forward, we welcome you to prepare yourselves for this ritual of gratitude, to sit up in your seat and take a reverent breath in as we hear and witness the power of ancient story and its message for us today. Let us begin. the ancient story of creation from the book of Genesis. At the beginning of creation of the heavens and earth, when the earth was wild and waste, darkness over the face of deep, a rushing spirit wind hovered over the face of the deep. The heart of the divine spoke saying, let there be light, and there was light. And the creator saw all of us and declared, this is good. We are grateful for the light of all lights, the light by which we see and are seen, the light by which we know and are known, light. The heart of the divine spoke saying, let the waters of the earth come together in one place and let there be a dome to hold back the water above the earth. And so it was, the immersed oceans were formed, and great lakes. The Creator saw all of this land and declared, this is good. We are grateful for water, essential and nourishing to all that is life. Then the Creator looked upon the dry land that had been formed. It was the soil from which all plants grew. The Divine named the dry land Earth and declared it was good. We are grateful for soil in which all plants and trees 
are rooted and in which we have the ground of our being. The heart of the divine speaks, saying, let growing things come forth from the soil. Let there be plants with their own kinds of seeds. Let there be peas and beans, corn and cabbage. And so plants grew, each with their own seed. And the Creator saw all of this and declared, this is good. We are grateful for plants, for the fruit and for the seed, that which brings the story of life anew to us, that brings us food and for the growing of all things. And the divine heart speaks, saying, let there be flowers of all kinds to brighten the earth. And so it was that colorful flowers came forth from the soil, yellow and gold flowers, pink and purple flowers, flowers to delight the eye and gladden the heart. And the Creator saw all of this and declared, this is good. We are grateful for flowers which bloom, flowers which brighten our days with color. And the divine heart speaks, saying, let trees be rooted in the soil. And so it was that trees of all kinds took root in the soil, trees with delicious fruits to eat, and other trees of many kinds, maple and mahogany, cedar and cypress, oak and aspen. And the Creator saw all of this and declared, this is good. We are grateful for trees, the largest of plants, who by their very breath give us breath to live. And the divine heart speaks, saying, let the waters bring forth living creatures of all kinds. And so it was that sea creatures of all kinds came into being, from great whales to tiny minnows, every kind of creature that lives in the waters. And the Creator saw all of this and declared, that is good. We are grateful for the creatures that swim in the seas and live in the lakes, in all the waters of the earth. And the divine heart speaks, saying, Let birds fly in the heavens. And so it was that creatures with wings appeared, from great hawks to tiny hummingbirds, every kind of creature that flies in the air. And God saw that it was good. We are grateful for the birds of the air who inspire us with our own lives to take flight. And the divine heart speaks, saying, Let the earth bring forth, forth living creatures. This is when wild beasts appeared, and snakes that crawl on the ground, and mice and rabbits, deer and dogs, cats and cows, all the animals that live upon the earth. And this too was good. And we are grateful for the animals that are our closest. <laughs> Can't. We are grateful for the animals that are our closest kin. And the divine heart <clears throat> speaks, saying, let us make creatures in our own image and likeness to watch over and protect protect everything we have made. <clears throat> so humans were created in the image and likeness of the creators they were made, male and female. We are grateful for human life, for consciousness, and for the holy pause that cause us to see face to face. <laughs> And the divine blessed the human creatures with the ability to choose, to create, and to destroy, and charged them with the care of the whole creation. 
and the Creator saw all this that had been created, and the Divine Spirit was in all that had been created. And the Creator saw all this and declared this is good. I invite you now to hear the words of Emerson, who asked that we take our teachings and we invite them to move us along as a wave moves a surfer through the sea, one called to cooperate with great power, to express life and life abundant in the world. Hear these words. Be not slave to your own past. Plunge into the sublime seas. Dive deep and swim far. So you shall come back with self-respect, with new power, with an advanced experience that shall explain and look beyond the old. Our theme in this spring season is creativity. And by creativity, I want to point us not simply to the work of artists, which is profound, but I want to ask you to think about creativity as something as small and yet important as your next decision. In the ancient world, the word to make, to do, to create, 
literally suggests the smallest moment in which you are participating as a co-creator of the universe by no more than taking a breath. This is the creation power that is pointed to, not a, not a magic of a story of animals and trees and plants that somehow appeared in a desert. It is the power most profoundly expressed in the human ability to be conscious, to decide. And so I want to ask you to make a decision this morning, the decision in answer to a question. What time is it? Almost no one looked at their watch. Outstanding. By what time is it I ask you to pay attention to the rhythm of the scripture you heard this morning spoken by our coming-of-age youth who gave it great voice. It is a movement between something called honor and something called reverence. These are times into which we are. The question is, do we know what time it is? Is it a time to honor or a time to revere? My sense is that our culture is quite good at honoring. Many of you participate in regularly in honoring kinds of events, birthdays, academic awards ceremonies, achievement, But this is not the honoring to which I point. The writers of the Talmud, which is a, a wisdom tradition drawn from the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, makes a powerful distinction between honor and reverence. And I want you to find it in your own experience. To honor is about doing about deciding, choosing, and making. To be an artist, to view the world, and then to make a representation of it is an act of honor. It is to perceive and then to act. But the wise instruction of Talmud also suggests to us that it is impossible to honor without its necessary partner, reverence. And it is, in fact, my observation that we have largely forgotten how to revere in a culture which is profoundly consumed with its honorings, with its appearances, achievements, its affluences, the things we do. Reverence is about the things we have the skill to not do. And that's where I want to point us this morning, towards a moment of profound ability to complete the circle of honoring, which is not a bad thing. To honor is to take the gift of life and further it. It is to be a co-creator of the world. But the many who have come before us, who have walked this human experience, suggest to us that we shall not honor well if we don't know how to revere. Reverence is the stuff that conspires us to pause. Any of you who are parents can touch immediately a moment of reverence the first time you were stopped in your tracks as you watched your baby sleep. Something of your breath left you. And there was even underneath that moment of reverence, of not doing anything, there was no diaper to change. There was no toy to clean. 
There was only an invitation into a sacred space which could see and to name as good. There's the language from the ancient story. All that had been honored by this life to that moment. Can you go there? Even if you don't have children of your own, I think you can, if you've been in the presence of a sleeping baby, there is a bit of the explanation of reverence there that I'm not sure that we've really explored because the meaning of reverence suggests not just the kind of still Zen moment that many spiritual traditions suggest we should be pursuing. Within reverence is also the terrifying. The sense that I have participated in creating something so profound that it rightly scares me a bit. Reverence requires, I want to suggest, a higher ability. An ability to be with the thing with which the creation story began. Chaos. Brokenness. Unformedness. It is the thing that I can only describe to you best by pointing back to the way and place I was raised. I grew up in Northern California, not far from the beach, and I was not a good surfer, but I knew a lot of people who were. And it was surfing culture that brought me the first glimpse of the thing which is realized so profoundly here at Fountain Street that religious expression did not require a building so much as it required a people. Surfers are a profoundly religious people. And their ways are not often practiced in the kind of formal setting that we have here, but they are unmistakable. And mostly they are the practices of reverence. Because to be a surfer is to deal with the ocean. To ask something powerful enough to kill you. To give you just enough space to be fully alive. And there is a move in surfing culture, which I was stunned when I tried to find a picture of it this week to to bring to our chapel worship service where we have the ability to show film. Longboard surfers, the ones who began the tradition, surf on these huge 10, 12, 13 foot long surfboards. Not the thing you see on ESPN. And when you're really good at that, when you have become a master of the longboard, You can do this thing called hanging heels. You all might be familiar with hanging 10, where you put the toes over the edge of the surfboard and you stand out in front, and it's it's an awesome act. To hang heels is to turn around backwards at the end of your board and bow to the wave. It is truly awesome. And it is the place where I could touch for the first time the greatest art between honor and reverence. Because there is no doubt it takes tremendous skill to find that moment, to come up on the wave, to hold the balance. But when one is truly gifted at revering, it's possible to stop doing the surfing and to turn and bow to the wave. And my sense is that each one of us touches that somewhere. Artists and athletes call it the flow. When you can stop doing, honoring, expressing, and turn and bow to the moment, which can, can almost feel like an eternity, though it might only last a moment, as long as the moment you're able to be still in front of that sleeping baby 
because it's really hard to stand there, isn't it? You want to. It's so extraordinary. There is so much power in life in it, and yet it's almost too much to bear. But it is the thing worth being alive for, is it not? The moment of the bow. We touched it just, just two days ago at a memorial, and I think really at all memorials, if we're willing to be there, not simply to honor those who have passed, but to revere, to turn and bow to all that has been created in their life and is now done. And have our breath taken away by the extraordinary arc of life and its expression. So how is it that we can know if we're actually being reverent? I mean, we all want to get it right, right? I can suggest just a couple of things. One of them based in the very word expressed in that creation, poetry, ra'ah. It means to see, and the divine one saw. But that seeing is about a vision of regard. It is about an ability to observe, to watch, to give one's full attention, to gaze in a trembling awe. which probably means you're not talking. The other part of Ra'ai and the naming of the good that happens in that creation story is the requirement that it happen in something called face-to-face. In the Semitic world, to see something face to face is not literally to put a human face on something, but it is to regard the face of all created things. There is a face in a tree. There is a face in a fish. There is a face in a stone. And to revere requires one turn their face to the face. This is what happens when the surfer turns around and bows to the wave. It is what happens in that holy moment when we can... And I got just a glimpse of it. I'm so grateful to our baby today, who when I said face to face, knew in a language neither of us speak, to turn, and and the faces were there. And you know this is what it's about. You know how powerful this is because you know how hard it is to give your face to somebody. When was the last time you gave your eyes, the window of your face, in reverent awe to the one with whom you have co-created the world? Whether it is a sibling or a parent, a child or a neighbor, to invite them into that moment which is so raw, so powerful. It's described in your bulletin this morning by my Hebrew professor who I think just got this as right as it can be gotten. To be reverent is like being invited to stand at the core of a nuclear reactor, aware that the only thing between you and a power that could destroy you and a power that could bring more life than you could ever imagine is separated from you only by a thin veil of glass. That's what happens at the moment of birth, the moment of death, the moment of joy, of elation, of height. And it is the moment when we miss, when we don't know what time it is. And so I call us one and all this week to be the messengers, to preach the gospel of Fountain Street Church that would ask and wait in reverence This question with all we know and love, what time is it? Is it time to honor, to make life, to make art and music? Boy, isn't music that place where when you know a song by heart, you can meet it face to face. You don't have to think about it anymore. You don't have to do it. You don't have to perform it. You can just sing and bow to the power of the notes. 
We are a nation and a community of people who are deeply invested in the practices of doing, and that's not bad. Indeed, it is our ability to set in motion new creations that has made us a people capable of curing disease and of saving many things worth saving. But let us not lose the essential knowledge that honoring the next thing we might do or create can only happen if we are willing to ask and answer the question, what time is it? Is it the time to honor or to revere? And I sense that these wonderful animals, and do you notice how quiet they are? They know something's happening here. They are the ones who can teach us how to look face to face. When you're on the streets this week, don't miss the chance to stop that neighbor walking their dog and ask to see the divine face to face. As our junior choir gathers, I will remind you all that the blessing of the animals will immediately follow their shalom. Shalom in itself as a word is powerful in that it is a peace that is offered which also contains within it an honoring, a reverence of the chaos that is not eliminated by peace, but one that is gathered up as the divine gathered up all things and said, indeed, this is good. Welcome to come forward down the outside aisles with your animals, whether they are your living companions or other representatives of your life with the creation, to come and meet both Reverend Barnum and myself at the bottom of the aisle here and then return out the center aisle. You may stay for the liturgy or if it is more helpful for you to join us in the, sanct in the social hall, please do to meet the many wonderful creatures and servants of the created world which have gathered here to bless us today. Go, friends, and seek the divine one who waits for you face to face, whether it be in the face of an animal or in your beloved. Go and be a gift unto the world.